Um, first, when and where were you born? I was born in uh, Jersey City in April 1920. Okay. Uh, Can you tell me about some about your parents or your siblings growing up? Um, well, my parents came from Ireland, and I was the oldest of six children. So, and we um, we we went to school in St. Paul's Parish, St. Paul's Grammar School in Green, the Greenville section of Jersey City. And then I went to uh, St. Peter's Prep after after elementary school. So. Can you tell me about some? Do you have some recollections of your days at St. Peter's Prep? Yes, the uh, the um, uh, we we um, studied hard, and um, um, the, the classes were relatively small. We had only ninety eight graduates. The tuition was only uh, one hundred twenty five dollars a year, uh, and. Um, and I used to deliver newspapers uh, that helped help pay the cost of going there. I, I, I delivered newspapers while I was in high school. Yeah. Who were some I had of a your newspaper route. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Who, who were some of your influential Jesuit teachers there that you remember? Well, there was Father. Um, there was a um, Father. Uh, he later Father Thomas Doyle, and then there was a Father Lawrence McHugh. They're both deceased now, and then uh, there were some very good, um, very some very good lay teachers too. Mr. Arthur Madden, and uh, Mr. John Mullen, and uh, uh, Mr. M McVeigh, and, and then there was Father Shalou, who was the the student counselor. He had a lot of influence on us. Just, how would you describe Father Shalou um, from your recollections of him as a, a student? Well, he was uh, very approachable and he was very easy to talk to. And he made, he was there for a long time after I, I was there, and he made a great number of friends among the alumni. They all look back to Father Shalou, yes. He's deceased now, too. Yes. What about Mr. McVeigh? I think he was one of a number of uh, young teachers who were going to graduate school at the same time or law school, but they were still very good teachers, I thought anyway at the time. And uh, he, uh, at least uh, I felt I had a good grounding in mathematics from teachers like him. Very uh, good. Would you say uh, mathematics was your number one subject? Well, it was one of the subjects I liked. Uh, you know. We also had Latin and Greek, and uh, French, and uh, geometry, trigonometry, as, and also in math. You know. So. And what year did you graduate from uh, St. Peter's Prep? Uh, 1937. Yes. And after St. Peter's Prep, where did you go to uh, college? Now, after, after I graduated from St. Peter's Prep, I uh, entered the Society of Jesus that summer after graduation. And there were a number of others who uh, entered with me from St. Peter's Prep also, uh, f four or five other, other young men entered with me too. And uh, I, w <coughs> I went to St. Andrew and Hudson, Poughkeepsie, New York, for my novitiate and what we call the Junior Eight, which are the equivalent of the first two years of college, but we, we stress very much Latin and Greek and English studies during those two years. Do any other, um, what other studies or uh, outside of the main curriculum for a Jesuit did you have to uh, study? In, uh, after I finished there? Right. Well, after I uh, finished uh, junior eight, I, I went to the Philippines. Uh, we, the, you, scholastics, we were called scholastics, seminarians, but we were called scho Jesuit scholastics. We, we used to go to the Philippines for six years, those who went, three years of uh, studying over there, and then three years of teaching, and then we were supposed to come back for theology after that to uh, Woodstock. So I went. I went in 1941, just before the war started, in the Second World War. 
What were some of your uh, interesting teaching experiences in the Philippines? Well, well, um, well when I, I, I was only there a few months when the war came. And um, so the, and the, um, um, the Japanese bombed Manila, even though it was declared an open city. And we, we, have, we were at Novaliches, which was about 10 miles from Manila when the, um, in December 8, 1941, when the war came. So uh, there were a number of young Americans there, so we said, we better get out of here, the Japanese land anywhere nearby. So we went into Manila, and it was uh, Christmas Day, 1941. There was a lot of bombing going on. We were uh, in this at near grade school. The Jesuit had a grade school in the Wolf City, and we stayed there that day. And then a week later, the Japanese came into Manila. Uh, How'd you uh, get out of uh, Manila? <laughs> well, we were, we, were, we were in the Philippines during the whole war. Where were you? Why? Um, we were under, um, but under house arrest for um, until July of 1943. Then the Japanese interned us. They allowed Protestant and Catholic missionaries to stay out of the internment camp, but under house arrest um, uh, until July of 1943. And then we were we were taken away uh, to the internment camp in 1943. Yeah. Must have been some experience. Um, yes. I but I, I was able to do my studies then during the war. Our schools were closed, but we were able to continue our studies. So the food wasn't much, but uh, we managed. Yeah. So what did you, what'd you study to um, enha enhance your... Uh, well, what, what we did, we studied... Uh, what Jesuits study three years of philosophy before um, we go out to teach. So. Um, uh, I, I finished my philosophy there uh, during the war, and then I even started theology, which usually would be postponed until after teaching. But I started my theology there, but it didn't go very long before we were interned, and after that we couldn't study. You know. No. Okay, so um, 1945, uh, after the uh, war, um, uh, did you come back to the United States, or? Yeah, we were. We were freed by paratroopers. They, they jumped on the um, 11th Airborne Division. They jumped on the uh, camp and freed more than 2,000 Americans, um, including a lot of women and children. Many of them were weak because of hunger. We were poorly fed. Uh, but uh, none, of, none of the internees was uh, greatly injured, but they, they, they killed all the Japanese guards and got us out, out of the camp. And, uh, and then, then we, we, were, we, came, we were sent back to the States then in 1945. So I had no teaching at that time over there. Uh, okay. I had my um, teaching here at Fordham Prep for two years, from 1945 to 1947. Yeah. Okay, so when did you uh, start at St. Peter's College? <clears throat> well, after, uh, I, um, after teaching for those two years, I went to theology for four years at Woodstock College in Maryland. And, and after I finished my studies there and what we call tertianship, it's like a third year of novitiate, um, I went to graduate studies in Belgium, two years in Belgium, yeah, at the University of Louvain, I got a, a, where I got a doctorate in philosophy. Yeah. And then after that, I, uh, I taught for a semester at Fordham and then in 1955, I went back to the Philippines. Yeah. And I was there until um, 1969. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so um, in that decade, any um, so notable? I, I t oh. Interesting. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> so I was teaching in, uh, at the Jesuit philosophy that was young Jesuits. It, it's young Filipino and American Jesuits in Cebu. That's the second largest city in the Philippines. I was there for six years and during those, um, those years, and then I was teaching at the Ateneo de Manila University in Manila the last uh, eight years, so until 1969. Yeah. You've been all over the world, wow. 
Well, <laughs> pretty, pretty much. much. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, fast forward to 1969 then. And then uh, I came back to the States in 1969. I was teaching for um, a, um, a year at St. Joseph's College in, in Emmitsburg, Maryland. Then after that, I was for a, a year at a Spring Hill College, a Jesuit college in Mobile, Alabama. Then the following year, I came to St. Peter's, and I've been here since. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll retrace for a minute. Um, can you tell me about some of the, your um, more of your Jesuit training as you uh, became a full uh, priest and, uh, and all yeah. that during the 1960s, I guess, as you uh, studied more and taught more and, and all yeah. that? Any recollections? Yeah, well, I, uh, um, I had a year sabbatical at Georgetown to, to study medical ethics. Um, and then I came back here and I taught the uh, student nurses in, in different hospitals around. And I taught here, I taught at St. Peter's College. I taught medical ethics for many years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So St. Peter's, yeah. when was your... Uh Actually, the first year there, you were, it was 1969. Right? Yeah, first year here was about night. I had one year, I came back from the Philippines one year, 65 to 66. That was my first year here. So, see, I was in the Philippines as a priest from 55 to 69, but I was one year back during that year, 65, 66, I toured here. Yeah. Okay, when you started here, what was your special um, field of study or teaching? Well, I did a, a fair amount of teaching of uh, Greek, the ancient philosophy, and also uh, uh, the history of philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. Who were some of your uh, favorite philosophers or Greek um, poets? or? Whatever? Well, Plato, Aristotle, um, and I also uh, I taught um, Aquinas, and I've taught Descartes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, for um, for your students, did you also um, expect them to learn these and uh, what other um, yeah. areas within your specialty? Yeah. Well, um, as I said, I taught um, taught this and I taught medical ethics, and um, I, um, I enjoyed teaching medical ethics, especially for um, um, sometimes we had veteran nurses come here in the evening, and. Uh, I learned more from them in many ways than they, they learned from me because they they had a lot to contribute to the class. So it was good teaching veteran nurses who would come back to St. Peter's to get a degree. You know. yeah. Speaking of women, did you um, how did you feel teaching the uh, well? You were around the first women's class in 1966. How were women yeah. the students? Do you uh, do you recall? Well, I wasn't here until. Um, until the 70s, early 70s, but uh, by that time, I think they were uh, they were more or less, you know, similar to the uh, to the uh, students in intelligence. I think the first students, the first female students we got were 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 uh, maybe very good, but then they, uh, after a while, they I think they level out and, and like the males, you know. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll we'll call him on that one. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No. How about diversity at school? African Americans, Hispanics, Chinese. Well, I think that's one of the good qualities of St. Peter's College that it has such diversity because <clears throat> that's the world that the um, students are going to go out into in the next 20, 30, 40 years. It's a very it's, we have a very um, a varied population in the United States, and uh, I think that. Students here at St. Peter's College learned how to mingle and deal with people of different ethnic backgrounds. What do you think of the phrase, um, I believe it's a Jesuit phrase, um, be all to all men in order to win all? Is that is that right? <laughs> yes. Okay. What, do you, what do you think of yeah. that phrase in relation to... Well, I think to it's good t for us to, um, to, under to try to understand the background and the culture that uh, our students are coming from. Uh, we can better uh, help them learn if we know something of their background. So in that sense, uh, it's, it's good to 
into their door and uh, have them c come out yours, you know. Speaking of which, have you had any memorable students um, in your tenure at St. Peter's College that stand out in your mind? Yeah. Yes, one of the students I had was, um, the, well, yeah, was Marilyn Clark, who was uh, quite a good student. Um, she, in fact, she was even doing some teaching while she was a student here. and. Um, she later became a prosecutor, and now she's a judge. And her mother is that, the, um, the author of many books now. Um, so uh, she's, uh, she, she stands out as, a very good, have, as having been a very good student. But I've had many others. Um, uh, just this past year, I had a um, Student who came from Ukraine who is very good. She's still she's still here. Yeah. Do any of your old students keep in touch with you after they graduate? Um, some of them do, but they they move away or they you know they they get involved in their, their work and their families. So I th I think they come back maybe much later. And many of them they don't come back right away. So. But I hear from some of them, yes. I've heard from some of them, yeah. Very good. Okay, well, we'll backtrack a little bit. Um, okay, why, why were you assigned to St. Peter's College? Was it by choice or by assignment? Oh, by choice. We, we, I, we apply for a position, as you know. You have to, you can't, um, so I, um, I was in Mobile and I, I was happy to be able to come back to St. Peter's. You know. So I was accepted in the philosophy department around 1972. Yeah. What did you hope to accomplish once you started at St. Peter's? What was your game plan? Well, my game plan was to help students to, um, in philosophy to be able to think, to be able to uh, think on some of the more uh, basic questions concerning the meaning and the purpose of their lives and um, and what great philosophers have said about good and evil and and the existence of God freedom of the will um, and, and particularly recently and some of the medical ethical questions about euthanasia and uh, uh, the taking care of the um, critically ill and how much you have to how much we have to use extraordinary means to keep people alive these are very vital questions nowadays and uh, so it's good to discuss them in class do you sense a, a very keen interest on the part of your students when they've been in the beginning uh, some of them need a little motivation in philosophy because they, uh, they're, I think many of them are um, uh, concerned with how they're going to make a living when they come here, and so they maybe they don't see how philosophy fits into that. Maybe they don't consider it uh, that important. But I think philosophy is important for their basic uh, education because if they don't learn how to uh, to uh, to um, think more deeply on certain issues and to be able to communicate their ideas to others, they won't get very far, you know. Uh, okay, so what were some of your first impressions of the college and the campus once you arrived in uh, Jersey City? Well, my uh, first impression, I suppose, was that um, I think <clears throat> I think many of our students uh, are very down to earth. The, I don't think you can um, uh, fool them very easily. I think they they they're um, they're concerned about their future and um, preparing themselves for the future, and uh, the uh, they want they want to learn. Uh, perhaps some of them. Um, 
find studying, they may not be used to regular studying for each day's class, and they have to get used to that. And, and the competition is uh, probably greater than when they were in grammar school and high school and college. And, and the teacher is going to, um, a good teacher, I think, is going to to um, teach for the better students in class. So uh, if the, you know, all the rest have to keep working hard to keep up with uh, what's being presented in class. So I think it's a challenge for them. And uh, uh, I think that's the, what a teacher should do, is challenge all the students and make them work a little bit more than they want to work. <laughs> what would you say your te teaching philosophy is? Um, I mean, how would you go about um, teaching a class? What's your well, I've um, used different methods. And I, I change the course every year, really. I use different methods. But the ideal way would be to have the students read their philosophers in the original. But sometimes it's quite difficult for them because, first of all, the not only is the thought difficult, but if, um, even the English, if it's 20 or 30 years old sometimes, uh, they don't understand all the words. Or so, so sometimes I have them read the original, at least selections of the original from different authors. Or... Um, Sometimes I, we just study what they, what the others have said. These writers have, have taught, what they have said. So sometimes that's a bit easier. If if uh, somebody else tells you what Aquinas held or what Aristotle held or what Plato held, but it is better if they can read the original. And even if it's only a small part of Plato or Aristotle, if they can read the original. They get something out of it. So you encourage the students to take Greek or Latin in addition? No, to we do it in the uh, translation. There are good translations. Yes. Okay, very good. <laughs> yes. I know Latin and Greek are uh, Greek to me, but... Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay, so what kind of work schedule did you have during an average day as a teacher? Or still do? Well, uh, when I was a full-time teacher, we had, we had four sections to teach, so it was a, a it was an absorbing work because you, if you want to, if you want to keep the students motivated and working, you have to give them uh, occasional quizzes and tests, and because they they work harder when they know they're going to be examined on what they've learned. So, if you have a, four sections and you give tests have a lot of correcting of papers to do. And I think that's one of the hardest jobs of a teacher is the correcting of papers. Yes. Yeah. So that took a good bit of time in between classes as well as preparing for the next next class. You know. So what kind of tests do you administer? Um, mostly essays and... Yes, I'd give, um, I'd give maybe one question. I'd give a quiz with maybe one question on the ideas of the author we're reading and to see whether they understand understand that author or ask them to to tell me what what he's saying on this particular page so it makes it forces them to uh, to be able not only to understand the writer but also to be able to communicate his ideas to someone else and uh, that's part of the educational process yeah. very good are you okay? Would you like to take a break? Or doing good? Doing good so oh. far. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're almost on page two. Okay. Can you tell me um, some of the class titles you have taught through the years, and which are some of the most memorable of those? Well, I've t I've taught uh, I've taught a lot of courses in medical ethics at St. Francis Hospital, St. Mary's Hospital. Um, Holy Name Hospital in Teaneck. Um, 
st mainly student nurses there. But I've also taught it here at St. Peter's College. And, then, and, uh, and so that course was called Medical Ethics. The other courses now are Introduction to, to Philosophy, first part or the second part. Most of the students take only those courses in philosophy. Uh, uh, I've also, earlier on, I had some, uh, I had a course on existentialism. Um, uh, and um, so, but as I said, my my main course in it uh, over and above the uh, ordinary philosophy courses was medical ethics. Yes. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Um, outside of the classroom, have you been involved in different uh, social school related activities like clubs and whatnot? I mean, have you been the moderator for different organizations? Yes, I was the. Um, the moderator for the Knights of Columbus when I was active here at St. Peter's, and chaplain for the Knights of Columbus for a number of years. Uh, we no longer that that organization is no longer functioning in the college, but we had some uh, students who were very, very good at it some years ago. Uh, what some of your duties entail, and what were some of the aims of the Knights? Well, the Knights of Columbus uh, uh, is a group of laymen. And they're they're active all through the United States, um, and they um, they they really um, help help uh, Catholic laymen to contribute of their talents and their energy to the work of the church. So, uh, and um, they've also uh, done. <coughs> They've also helped to raise money for different uh, needs of the church. Um, uh, but we used to um, we used to have a clothing drive and food drive, and the knights also can visit the hospitals and visit the sick. You know. So, as chaplain, did you do any other special um, functions? Now, my <clears throat> my main. The idea was to uh, encourage them and to uh, to encourage them and to uh, get the knights to, to come to the meetings. If there was a moderator there, it facilitated things. You know, but the the knights themselves ran the meetings. You know. Okay. Um, can you tell me? Uh, did you have any rules or regulations imposed upon you as a teacher at the college that you recall? Or there are certain guidelines to follow. <laughs> now we we're given quite a bit of freedom, um, even in the philosophy department. They're not. We're um, a lot of trust is put in the t in the uh, professor, and each of us taught philosophy probably in a different way. Each member of the um, of the philosophy department. Because we all came from different back, different backgrounds, we studied in different graduate schools, so it was left to each one to determine the content of the course and how, and, uh, how he would teach it. So, uh, so in that way, uh, it was quite satisfactory, I thought. Excellent. So, have you been the, Have you ever been published? And if so, what are some of the titles of? Um, your works. Yeah, I've, public, I've pub published a, a, f a few articles. As I, <clears throat> I was in the Philippines, a good part of my life as a teacher, and um, uh, so uh, I, I, um, I published. Just I remember an article on um, the um, self knowledge and the immortality of the soul. Um, I've also. Uh, published an article on my work uh, during the year I had at Georgetown on uh, uh, studying medical ethics. And, uh, yeah. Okay. And um, did a number of book reviews. Have you yeah. Any, yes. uh, any, any uh, ones that stand out in your mind? Uh, well, I. <coughs> I did uh, one book review on 
by Albert Dundane on Faith in the World, a book which I thought was very influential. He's a professor at Louvain. Yes. Okay. Can you tell me about, um, switching gears a little bit, can you tell me about some of the, um, your colleagues in the philosophy department um, that you've worked with through the years? And give me your, some of your impressions of each. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there were, there were, we had, uh, when I first came here, Professor Caulfield was the chairman of the department, Joseph Caulfield. And uh, then we had um, Father Dates. He was all, he later he was also a chairman of the department, and um, uh, we've had um, uh, see Father Thomas McGann taught ethics for a number of years, and uh, uh, yeah. I forget some of the others over the twenty five. The twenty-five years I've been here, but we've always had um, we've always had a very um, peaceful, cooperative department, and uh, I think we work well together. Uh, what are some of the characteristics of Mr. Caulfield that you remember, uh, administrator as a as yes. a as a? Yes. Well, he uh, he uh, was very interested in uh, Thomas Aquinas and. Uh, he, uh, we got into some good discussions on, on uh, some of the um, um, problems that Aquinas dealt with, uh, that he, uh, and the influence of Aristotle on Aquinas. Uh, that's all I can say about him. Yeah. How about Father McGann? Father McGann, uh, he's still living. He's up in. Um, our province infirmary now, and he um, uh, he uh, taught ethics here quite a few years, and wrote a little book on it that uh, he he used in class, and that uh, uh, gives a good summary of many of the basic ethical issues, uh, which I've I've used occasionally in my classes. Yeah. Uh, and who's the other Jesuit you mentioned, uh, Father? Um there, uh, for the dates, dates for yes. the dates, yes. yes. Yeah. Any recollections of, of his? No, I just I don't remember him uh, all that well. He uh, he was I was here with him only for a year, few years. Um, he was already getting fairly old when I knew him. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, um, we'll see. We'll test your memory on the presidents of the college and and your, your relations with them. Yeah. We'll start with uh, the famous Father Vic. Uh, what are some yeah. of your impressions of, of Father? Well, Father Father Yanatelli was a very warm and friendly person, and uh, he made many friends for the college, and he was quite influential, I think, in uh, among government officials in northern New Jersey, and he served as um, a member of the board of the Port of Authority. Uh, Port Authority uh, for a good number of years, a non-paid, a non-paid member. But uh, so it showed how highly regarded he was. Uh, Do you have any interesting uh, stories, uh, funny or, or or interesting ones? Well, one story they say tell about him is that it was expensive for the college for him to stand at a corner at a red light on the Kennedy Boulevard waiting to cross because he might give a scholarship away while he's standing there. <laughs> he was so generous. That's good. I never heard that one. <laughs> okay, uh, moving along. Uh, Father Glenn, Father yeah. Edmund Glenn. Yes. What are your recollections of, uh, of Father Glenn? Well, well yes, Father uh, I thought Father Glenn was, uh, he was quite active in uh, community affairs in addition to the college. And he kept the, um, he kept the uh, college solvent during his years here at St. Peter's. And 
he seemed uh, to be at ease in dealing with faculty and and um, student body and the student body. Um, I didn't have too much to do with him uh, personally. No. How about Father Degnan? Uh, Father Degnan. Yeah, uh, Father Degnan uh, really pushed the uh, residence halls, and I think that's done a lot for the college. He's he had well and well and hall built, and um, w with Father Degnan, we um, we we started to get many more resident students, and I think that's important for the college because uh, if you don't have resident students, you're dependent on only commuters. Uh, for the college, and that means you have only a very limited number to draw from. So if you want to improve the academic quality of the college, you have to draw students from outlying areas uh, and be able to take the best of them. You know? So in that way, we sh hopefully with more resident students, the um, academic quality of the college should improve. Yeah. How, do you how do you think the, um, uh, asking you a question in between here, um, how do you think the um, academic um, life of the college has changed when, from when you started in the early 70s to today? Well, one thing uh, I've got to say is that uh, with regard to the subjects the students take, um, nowadays, or at least un until recently, uh, a great it seemed, it seemed the um, the department that was most uh, frequented is the uh, the major that the students choose mostly is the um, business management. Uh, but in earlier years, I think uh, what we did was, if a student wasn't successful in some other area like history or English or philosophy, we encouraged them to take business management. Now they're all now the they're all choosing it. Willingly, they want it. I don't know what that says, but uh, I guess they're not as much uh, interested in taking the liberal arts as they used to be, uh, as a major, anyway. Well, how about philosophy majors? How ma how has the drop been? And do you have a lot of intense? Um, we don't have many philosophy majors. We always have a few, but we don't have many. And I think one reason for that is that. Uh, Many of the students are, uh, are uh, I think they're, they're concerned about getting a job after college, and they, they think that philosophy doesn't help them for that. But uh, I think in the long run, uh, if they've had a good philosophy course, it, it will help them very much. But I don't think the students realize that. They, they say, how will philosophy get me a job? And they say, they don't see it, so they... Uh, they're not inter interested in taking a philosophy major. But I think it's, uh, if somebody wants to go into, uh, for example, law, I think philosophy is a very good preparation for, because it teaches you how to, uh, how to uh, uh, think deeply on, on basic questions and to be able to communicate your ideas to others. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, we'll put you on the spot and we'll finish up with the last president, Father Father Lagren. Yeah. Have you had any dealings with Father Lagren? <laughs> well, I haven't had any many dealings with any of our college presidents, but uh, um, but uh, I've always had good relations with all of them. Uh, I find that Father Lagren is a very hardworking president. He's always very pleasant and cheerful when you meet him, and uh, he stays down to earth. Uh, on, uh, so he, he enjoys uh, uh, being with the community and enjoys uh, he play he enjoys playing tennis in the local park and uh, uh, he was here as a as a young Jesuit and he had three happy years here and uh, as a young Jesuit teaching philosophy so um, he has uh, he he came back to St Peter's. Uh, because he enjoyed it here when he was here as a younger man, so and I think he still enjoys it, and uh, it's good to see that he enjoys his work, and uh, I think he's doing a lot for the college. Yeah.
Good answer. <laughs> he'll um, he'll definitely like to hear that. So uh, <laughs> tell me, um, who are some of your closest friends among the uh, Jesuits here at St. Peter's in the community? Well, my closest friends. Well, um, I suppose um, I can mention um, Father Dolan, Father Sheridan, Father um, um, Father John Rin, and um, those are some that stand out, but all of them, are, we, we all get along well together. Those, those three stand out, you know. Uh, okay, how about some Jesuits who have served as sort of mentors or um, inspirational to you? Do you uh, any, any that, uh, um, any fellow Jesuits? Well, um, I had some, um, <coughs> I had some, um, Good teachers going through the um, through my years in the high school. Um, I had uh, Father Thomas Doyle, Father McHugh, and then uh, uh, at Woodstock uh, we had some uh, um, Father McGinley, was, uh, and um, those. Those particularly stand out. Then Father Leo Colum in the Philippines. Um, we had some. Um, we had some. Um, I, there were some great Jesuits over there that I got to know during the war. And then afterwards, there was a Father John Pollock, um, whom I, uh, I admired very much. Very good. Yeah. Okay, can you tell me what um, what impact uh, Jesuit education holds for you as as a teacher here at St. Peter's? Mm. How do you how do you think the Jesuit experience has um, benefited St. Peter's? Well, what what I think Jesuit education uh, tries to do is to form leaders who are among uh, among our young people and also with a good um, um, with a good Christian background, so that they, uh, um, their faith and their um, their faith and their education help them to uh, get an understanding of themselves and the world they live in, and uh, and also that they should have a, a, a good, uh, a strong willingness to share in the fight for social justice in the world. By, uh, and many of them take part in um, social activities in the co while they're in here in college that, uh, that um, initiates them into that kind of activity. Um, so, uh, but um, the, the, uh, they get a good um, liberal education because we have a, a good, strong, I think, a core curriculum, and that, uh, that, that gives them a good training for whatever work they might plan to do in the future. And, but at the same time, we hope that they have good motivation to uh, contribute, not just to be out for themselves, but to contribute to the community, uh, uh, especially uh, on the, on the, along the lines of social justice. Exactly. Speaking of social justice and uh, religious um, life, um, how would you define the religious atmosphere here at St. Peter's? Well, there are plenty of opportunities for the students to uh, to um, to um, to um, have um, to make progress in their spiritual life. There's a campus ministry. We have um, we have regular uh, religious observances, and um, there's a daily mass, daily masses that they can attend, and uh, they can get counseling. And uh, but I think also the main the main uh, the main influence would be in the classroom and the uh, the ideas they get in the classroom and the teaching and philosophy and theology that forms their attitudes and their um, their uh, outlook. Uh, so. Uh, I think over four years, under under that influence, it can shape their whole mentality. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Very good. And how would you uh, describe the level of um, secular school spirit or um, uh, just just promotion of the college in general? Uh, uh, oh, okay, yeah. School yeah. spirit. Um, yeah. The, the students. How would they? Mm -hmm. How would you describe their? Uh, their, their well, I. Uh, I find that the students who come here seem, at least those I know, seem to like it here at St. Peter's. I know some of my own uh, nieces went to other colleges for a couple of years and then came here to St. Peter's, uh, and they liked it here at St. Peter's. Uh, maybe it's because uh, I think one thing I think they, uh, I think they like the faculty here and the teaching, but also I think they. Uh, they felt that they were that the it was easy to work with, deal with the students that they could mingle well with the students. Um, so. Now, many of our students uh, work a, uh, part time, so they they can't spend much time around. But on the other hand, in a way, that's an advantage too because they're they're serious uh, if they're working and. They're not just uh, fooling around, wasting their time. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Um, do, 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 moving down. Um, oh, almost there. <laughs> okay, can you tell me about uh, some of your commencement exercises? Um, as a Jesuit, you have to probably contribute or participate in them. Do any uh, stand out in your mind? Anything stand out in my mind? Not particularly, to be honest. Okay. None of them stand out. Did you ever sponsor I, anybody for uh, for an honorary degree? Uh, no, I did not. No, I didn't sponsor any. Okay, uh, coming down to the end here. Okay, what's some of the best advice or guidance you gave to some of your students in your your ob observations to um, the students you have taught? Uh, well, I've, um, I guess I, one, one way would be to, to show them how to study. Uh, some, some of them, uh, some students uh, haven't learned how to study, so you have to, uh, yeah, you have to kind of encourage them and help them. Uh, get, get a method of studying. Uh, I don't know whether that's your question or. Uh, okay. Well, actually, um, let's see. Advice. Let's well, say a student came up to you and yeah. um, they said, "Father Wayne, tell me, <laughs> give me some guidance for the real world um, uh, in terms of yeah. um, being Jesuit educated. How yeah. would you, how would you uh, prepare me for uh, life in?" Uh, Everyday, yeah. everyday life, as it were. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd say, as a student, your best preparation right now is to do well in your studies, and also to, uh, if you can, to, to take part in the, in the so some of the social activities in the college, because you you also have a social education as well as uh, academic. So, if you, if you. Uh, if you are responsible and um, uh, live up to your potential as a student, uh, that's a good sign that you're going to live. You're going to do the same after you leave college, and uh, also meeting with uh, other students and taking part in activities. Um, that's that's a great advantage for your own uh, training because uh, you have to be able to work with people, whatever work you're doing. It's mm -hmm. true. It's true. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, hold on. Um, in your estimation, in general, how how would you feel the St. Peter's experience has um, benefited you? Would you mm -hmm. say overall, oh. being at the college? <laughs> oh well, I I've I have found the um, I have found my work here very um, meaningful and um, uh, worthwhile. I've been very happy teaching here at St. Peter's. I think it's uh, very meaningful. And fulfilling work to be able to uh, help young people uh, in their in their color studies. Um, so uh, I have no um, 
no regrets that I that I'm a college teacher that I, that I'm at St. Peter's. I really en I've enjoyed the work and uh, I am, I enjoy uh, uh, dealing with young people, working with young people. What are some of your future projects on behalf of the school and yourself that you're that are in the works yeah. right now? Well, I'm uh, I'm retired officially retired, but I still uh, I still teach uh, half time. So, and uh, I hope I can continue. Uh, teaching half time because I like I like the work I enjoy the work I enjoy dealing with students and it keeps 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 me young. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And what, what are some of your other priestly duties besides um, uh, teaching? I I uh, direct retreats. I've been um, a number of summers. I've gone over. Um, I've been in Ireland a number of summers giving retreats. I gave some retreats in the Philippines. I also uh, 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 I also do pastor work during the summer. I've been out almost every weekend helping out in different parishes in the neighborhood. I was out in Wyoming earlier in the summer for several weeks, taking the place of a fellow Jesuit who had been here at St. Peter's from Cousineau. Wy yeah. Wyoming's kind of wide open. Not, not too many Catholics out there. No, <laughs> Did you, yeah. but they're nice people. Yeah, there aren't many people. That, I don't. I think there aren't uh, as many people as there are in Hudson and Essex County, in the whole of Wyoming. I was going to say statewide. Wow, there aren't. Uh, there are about half a million people there, but there's still many beautiful spots in Wyoming. Yeah. Okay, the last question I have is: um, We'll put you in the role of uh, promotions director of St. Peter's. You tell somebody who might be watching this video why they should attend St. Peter's and how they will benefit by it. Well, St. Peter's in the tradition of uh, uh, Jesuit, other Jesuit colleges, uh, gives um, a strong liberal arts um, education. Uh, no matter what your major is, uh, you will also take courses and. History, English, science, um, mathematics, languages, um, theology, philosophy, and this gives you uh, a background that um, helps you to become um, an educated person. And it's <coughs> it's intended only to be the beginning of your education, but hopefully you will develop interests while you're in college that you will. Uh, continue and develop after you leave college that will make you uh, uh, um, a well-read uh, person who is interested in, um, in, uh, uh, in reading and in um, um, drama and in um, politics and in uh, other areas of uh, our life and so that you can contribute of your um, of your talents and abilities no matter what work you're doing you can contribute to the community in many ways and I think in that way you will have succeeded in fulfilling the purpose of St. Peter's College which is to help con help train people who will be leaders in their community by being a leader it doesn't mean you have to be a politician but it means that you will you will foster community uh, by the, by the way you use your abilities and your uh, what you have learned in college. Thanks a lot, Father Ryan. Robert, do <laughs> you have any questions? Yes. Um, you have alluded several times to medical ethics. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would be very interested to hear your views on the recent controversy of cloning and how that could play a part in the medical field later. Um, yeah. Specifically, um, if we do clone a human being under what religious uh, statute are we upheld as human beings? Well, what cloning is is that you uh, you develop you create another person who is the exact. Uh, Replica of the per, of, uh, of a person already existing, and uh, what it does, 
What cloning does then is deprive us of the person of his uniqueness. As it is, we are all unique. Uh, so to be cloned means you're uh, you're like a chip off the old block, or you're uh, you're just uh, uh, like somebody else. You're uh, you're, no, you're not really identi You're not really unique. Uh, and why should we clone persons uh, if it's just to use them for other things? That's not a, in accordance with the um, with the dignity of a person. No person should be created to be used by others. So, to create a person, to create a clone, just for example, to get, as I've heard, to get bodily organs, uh, is to uh, make a person a means for somebody else. And uh, I don't would think we should do that. Have a soul? Is it possible that a copy would have a soul? Oh yes, if if, uh, <coughs> if we clone if we clone a human being, he would be a human being. But. Uh, I I think we would be depriving um, a person of his uni uniqueness. And also, uh, um, as it is now, a person is created for himself. Uh, the husband and, wa husband, and w husband and wife are given a child and um, uh, that child should be re should be um, respected and loved for what it is in itself, and not just as um, identical with someone else. Uh. How will you prepare your students for this new this new millennium that's coming? These questions are obviously going to come back again. Yeah. So how yeah. will you prepare your students in that you're teaching a medical ethics? and the issues of life and death. Well, I'm no longer teaching medical ethics. I haven't been teaching it now in a number of years. That's why I'm not really um, well, up on all the issues on cloning, you know, as I just gave. Advice, what kind of advice would you give them? But what, I, what, I, what we still do in philosophy is to stress the dignity and value of the human person. So I think that's the, uh, that's the main uh, issue in any question of medical ethics is um, the dignity of that human person, uh, the value of each unique human person. He should be valued, for, he or she should be valued for what they are in themselves, not for any purpose that we can use them for. So, uh, uh, so whether it's a question of euthanasia or abortion or um, care of the dying, we should always keep in mind the dignity of this person and um, how, how a person should be treated. Uh, so I think once you have that, then you have to come to how you handle a particular case. You know, is euthanasia contrary to that, to the dignity of a human person? That's what you have to deal with. The other and last uh, question along the lines of philosophy are, the American Indians believe that God was the great father or the mother spirit of the earth. Uh, Christians believe that God is more male, possibly, than female. Are they one and the same? I wouldn't say that Christians believe that God is more male than female. God, God, is, God has no sex, you know, because God is pure spirit. So it's only uh, people who have bodies that are either male or female, you know. So we uh, we look upon God maybe as a father, and maybe that's because of cultural reasons. But uh, um, God is neither no, neither not no more father than, than he is mother. And you can address God as mother if you want. There's no uh, thing. So, with regard to what you said about the Indians and the uh, Christians, there are ways in which we come together, we share. I think we should stress what we have in common rather than what we differ in what we differ. So I think the Indians and Christians would both look up to God as a source of our being and, and the one who watches over us or is concerned with us. So in that sense, we, uh, we, we share common, common ground. Thank you. 
Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Father.